Christian nations, yes, I, I could... But again, the safety still comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't want to ever give man or a nation or a class of people the credit or the glory for something that only belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Proverbs 21.31 says, The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. Psalm 118.8 says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Psalm 144.15 Happy is that people that is in such a case, yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. This is from his book, Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. He says, C.S. Lewis, ye must be born again. Till then... We have the duty, morality, the law, a schoolmaster, as St. Paul says. But the school days, please God, are to be numbered. Now notice what he said. You must be born again. And then he says, till then. What does that imply? That implies we're not born again in this life. We're born again in some hereafter thing. Till then, we have the duty, the morality, the law. Oh, so now we have the law, as the Bible talks about the schoolmaster, the law. Okay, as St. Paul says. This is exactly what the Pope believes. He said that on page 115 of Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. This is exactly what the Pope believes, that we are being born again. And that, you know, everything's perfected, but actually in the afterlife. Colossians... Colossians 2.10 says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. And then he goes on to say, another quote from C.S. Lewis, I do not at all regard mystical experience as an illusion. Well, I would believe that after reading what we read. He says, I think it shows that there is a way to go before death out of what may be called this world. Now this, okay, so he's saying, he doesn't regard mystical experience as an illusion. But I think it, meaning this mystical experience, shows that there is a way to go before death. In other words, we need to go the road of mystical experience before death out of what may be called this world. What Lewis here describes sounds like the modern day out of body experiences. It smacks of seducing spirits, which the Bible talks about in 1 Timothy 4.1. We've already quoted that verse. Colossians 2.18 says, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshipping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind. That is an absolute total verse describing C.S. Lewis. He's beguiling people. Did you know Lewis prayed for the dead? Oh yeah. This is a quote from C.S. Lewis. Page 107 of Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. Of course I pray for the dead. The action is so spontaneous, so all-inevitable that only the most compulsive theological case against it would deter me. And I hardly know how the rest of my prayers would survive if those prayers for the dead were forbidden. Is this... I mean, this is mind-boggling, these quotes. That's what he said. Of course he prays for the dead. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. What sense in there is praying, is there praying for the dead? Their, their, their destiny is sealed. Once you die, your destiny is sealed. Okay? It's heaven or hell. The rewards you're going to receive in heaven are sealed too. Okay? It's based on what you did in this life. But, you know, they, these people don't have that concept. Also note that C.S. Lewis thinks he could not even continue praying if he was forbidden to pray for the dead. Whew. He also says that there's a purgatory which we all must suffer after death. Well, so do the Catholics. He says, quote, I believe in purgatory. 
While he claimed to not believe in the extreme suffering that Roman church taught in earlier years, he held that our souls demand purgatory, end of quote, in order to make them pure enough for heaven. See, the blood of Jesus Christ wasn't enough for C.S. Lewis and all these other heretics and all these other religions. The blood of Jesus Christ is not enough. Even though Jesus Christ said when he was on the cross, it is finished. No, it's not enough for them. They've got to be able to do it through their own wicked works. And they never will. This idea is no doubt based on his heresy of salvation being a continuing and incomplete thing. He does, quote, assume that the process of purification will normally involve suffering. He likens it to be given a mouth rinse after a tooth is pulled. This, he says, will be purgatory. The mouth, the mouth rinse after the tooth being pulled. The rinsing may take longer than I can now imagine. The taste of this may be more fiery and astringent than my present sensibility could endure. End of quote. Again, see the above scriptures that we've already talked about. 2 Corinthians 5, 6, and 8. Uh, also Romans eight seventeen says, And if children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him which is also an earmark of a Christian. Well, I'm not suffering, I'm just warming some pew in some church somewhere and getting some cotton candy every week. I'm not suffering. Well, you probably aren't even saved. Okay, and granted, there's Christians that suffer different degrees around the earth. A Christian in China that's fearing for his life every day and may have his life taken from him is a far cry from somebody like that's in America like I am who really doesn't have any concept of that. And I admit that. I don't. I may in the very near future, but right now I don't. But it says, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. See, suffering is part of the Christian experience in this life, not in some purgatory thereafter. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So we suffer with Christ. He did his suffering on earth, not in heaven. Our suffering is done on earth at this present time. Not in purgatory, in the hereafter. Okay? Here's more. This is from Letters of C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis believed that purgatory was a process by which the work of redemption continues. And, per, and first... And first, perhaps, begins to be noticeable after death. That was from page 246 and 47 of, 247 of that book. Revelation 5.9 says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof. And for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Remember, by thy blood is how we get redeemed. Redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Redemption is through the blood of Jesus Christ alone. No purgatory enters into it. The price is paid in full. Hebrews 5 or 7.25 says, Therefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Praise the Lord. I mean, that's awesome. He also believed on page um, one uh, ten and one twelve in this book, he he uh, uh, reiterated that there is error in the Bible. We've already seen that he does. He believed that the Book of Job was not historical; that the Genesis account was um, pagan mythology. He believed that the Gospels were essentially a true myth, quote a true myth, whatever that means. Whereas the Bible says in Proverbs thirty five, every word of God is pure. And he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. He said, C.S. Lewis said, the Bible carries the word of God, but it is human material. Which is what a lot of people that want to justify their positions say. Oh no, the God's just written by fallible men. And, and, and it's, oh granted, I'm not saying they were perfect. But let's see what the Bible says about this, okay? 2 Timothy 3.16 3, says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Peter one twenty one says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. See, it was about the Holy Ghost working through them. It wasn't about some guy making up some story and putting it in the Bible. He believed that Plato, 
was a theological genius. C.S. Lewis says that Plato was an overwhelming theological genius in page 80 of that book that I just quoted. This fits with his perverted ideas of paganism being the childhood of religion. Paganism is the childhood of religion, he believed. And Christ was here to fulfill paganism. Man! He obviously could not tell God's truth from Satan's lies if his soul depended on it. Proverbs 15.2 says, The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of the fools pour out foolishness. That's all. His, his writings were foolishness. This is from the screw tape letters. He said, to be truly human, you must participate in the Tao. He said of the Tao, which is, the, which is from Chinese mysticism, like the Tao would be like the yin-yang, fire and ice, you know, that whole concept there. He said, quote, the Tao is the concrete reality in which to participate in is to be truly human. Now there's whole articles written about this, on just this one subject on almost a lot of the things that I'm saying here, there's whole things that other authors have written just expounding on each one. I'm just giving you the high points today. He says modern science is mostly based on the love of truth. Yeah, just like evolution. Well, which he agreed with that too. So, Here's a quote, another quote from good old C.S. No doubt those who really founded modern science were usually those whose love of truth exceeded their love of power. Wow. Huh. As we all know too well, modern science is all too often in opposition with the truth of God and His Word. 1 Timothy 6.20 nails it. It says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Isn't that an absolute accurate thing of what we're describing here? Grace be with them. Amen. Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Well, I'm telling you what, C.S. Lewis spoiled a lot of people after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Other heresies of C.S. Lewis. Perhaps the most spiritually indicting and revealing statement that Lewis ever made is quoted in C.S. Lewis, a biography by Roger Lynch and Green on page 276. Lewis and his wife were on a trip. When Lewis stated, quote, I had some ado to present to prevent, this is, the, this is this lady, he was totally, she was totally unbiblically divorced, and he totally unbiblically married her. So, her, him and Joy were on this trip in, in Greece, and Lewis said, quote, I had some ado to prevent Joy and myself from relapsing into paganism in Attica. And, but, remember this, to relapse into something means you've done it before. Like a drug addict lapses, or relapses, or an alcoholic relapses, okay? Well, I had some ado to present joy, pre prevent joy myself from relapsing into paganism in Attica. In other words, it was all he could do to prevent from relapsing into paganism in this Greece town. At Daphne, it was hard not to pray to Apollo the healer. <laughs> but somehow, one didn't feel it would have been very wrong would have only been would have only been addressing Christ's subspecies, Apollonius. Is this rank blasphemy at, at the highest order? I, I think so.